Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray for our online campus and for our people that are in here. I pray an incredible new blessing. A new blessing, a new anointing for a new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I have an interesting message today. I, I don't know if it's as much a preach as it is more, more like a, a fatherly talk. And we were in school ministry meeting. I think there was, I don't know, 70 or 80 of us in the school ministry meeting. Um, and we, we, we were just praying and Dan was leading the prayer time and we began to uh, prophesy. And, um, and, and people were prophesying things. And I, I had an experience at, at Oxford University. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I was, I was five, six days in, in um, England and I spent five, four days at Oxford. And, uh, and I had an experience there I want to tell you about in a few minutes. And, um, but when we were in this, in our prayer meeting, well, actually it wasn't a prayer meeting, it was actually a staff meeting turned into a prayer meeting. People began to prophesy things that were happening to me when I was at Oxford. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the Lord. And so um, I asked Haley, because Haley, Haley was probably one or four or five, but I uh, asked Haley if she could come up and share. Her eight-year-old son had a profound dream in line with what we've been feeling. And, uh, and then Haley had some revelation on that dream. So would you just share, share that with us? Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. So um, it feels like kind of uh, something that's kind of been pieced together over the, probably the last couple of months, but specifically the last few weeks. I was driving my son to school, uh, first week of school-ish, and I asked him as any mom would, how did you sleep last night? And he was like, bad. And I'm like, bad? Why do you sleep bad? And he was like, I had these crazy dreams and they were waking me up. And so I, was, I started asking him what the dream was about and into the dream, I began to realize God was speaking to him. And so he had this dream where he uh, went into a store with his dad uh, and it looked like Hobby Lobby and Target mixed together, which is a conundrum in and of itself. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there were different bins. There were bins with computer games, bins with stuffed toys, and then there was a wall of cards. And um, he said, some of the things were free and some of them you had to pay for. And his dad said to him, hey bud, mom's asked me to go buy some birthday cards, so why don't you go pick out a game, but make sure it's not free. This was the point where I was like, God must be speaking to my son because no parent tells you to pick out the game that's not free. And uh, so I stopped him. I said, are you sure? He said, no, it couldn't. He said, it had to cost us something. And so uh, I, he continued with the dream. He went over to a bin and pulled out a game. And on the front, he said, it said Chase. He said, not like the Paw Patrol character, like the bank. Do you know the bank, Chase Bank, mom? I was like, I do know the bank, Chase Bank, we go to it. He's like, okay, so it was Chase Bank and then the game was a mystery game. And when I went to go play it, I went in and I was trying to solve mysteries. It was like, it was really dark and really intense. So intense that I started thrashing around my bed and from thrashing around, I woke up. And uh, he actually ended up going back to sleep and he went back into the dream and he realized playing the chase game that, uh, that it was about to expire on August 15th. And he said he knew it was August 15th and he was playing it and he needed to play fast because it was about to expire. Well, at 1 a.m. on August 15th in his dream, the game expired. He returned it to the bin and he went to pick out another game and now he picked out the game called Dreams. And he said in this game called Dreams, he was called a dream crafter, like a combination of Minecraft and Lego, I don't know. But he, uh, he said, I was a dream crafter and I was whatever I built and took to bed became the reality that I lived in. And he said that the, the store was no longer Target slash Hobby Lobby. Now he said it was our home, but he said it was like Bethel Church. And he said it was wood on the outside and metal on the inside. And um, while he's sharing with, this, with me, it's like, I'm just getting a download from the Lord. And he said to me, Haley, you have, as a house and even as a community that you've been in a season of mystery that has cost you something. And it's been a season of radical investment into mystery and into the unknown. Um, and he, the Lord reminded me on August 11th and August 15th, this is so bizarre, but I climbed into my car and it smelled so strongly of pineapples. I was like hunting around my car trying to find it like when my kids drop a sweet, like a candy or a juice or something. And there was nothing in my car. So I texted Ben Armstrong, who's the dream interpreter. I was like, what does pineapples mean? And it's all about glory and authority and vacation and dreaming. Um, and, uh, and on August 13th, Dave Ward had called me and said, Haley, I have a word for you. It's a word for Bethel, but it's a word for you. And it was Psalm 126. 
And Psalm 126 says that when the Lord restored the captives from Zion, restored their fortune, they were like those who dreamed. Now, captives don't dream. <laughs> captives hold tight what they, because they've lost much, but these captives, they dreamed. Their mouths were filled with laughter and joyful shouting. And it ends with those who sowed in tears will come back with sheaves of wheat, with shouts of joy. And uh, Bill Johnson prophesied in uh, May, or was it uh, maybe April, when Artis Carter was hit by, an, by a car, he said that Artis will not die, he will live. It'll be a sign of Zechariah 1, that that which the enemy had raised up against Israel, the Lord would raise up artists uh, who, would, who would raise up a horn, a standard against the enemy. And what I felt was, I feel like for us as a church that the season has shifted. The season has shifted that we are stepping out of a season of mystery, of sowing in tears, and that the Lord is inviting us to actually close the chapter and to not even find comfort in those places that we, that we found comfort in, but to actually recognize that we will be like those who dreamed. And I believe the Lord is restoring innovation. He's restoring builders. He's restoring creatives. I believe we're all creative and the Lord is wanting to pour out His Spirit, the oil of gladness upon us, that we will dream again with the Lord and in His rest, we'll see it come to pass. Amen. Yeah. Why don't you just stand real quick? We're gonna grab a hold of this by faith. It says in the Word of God that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the rhema word. And so I just feel like today, even if that doesn't feel true, that by faith we're grabbing a hold of this and saying this is the Word of God. So Holy Spirit, right now, we thank You, Father, that You are bringing a season shift. We thank You, Lord, that You are declaring this and that we aren't grabbing a hold of this in desire, but we are grabbing a hold of it because You have spoken. And Lord, I thank You. I thank You that You have, you are, have every intention to restore the fortunes. You have every intention to restore that, what, that which has been lost. And God, I pray that You would pour out Your oil, Your oil of gladness on every household, on every uh, individual, on every business, on every call, on every dream. And Lord, I pray for a grace to step out of a season of mystery and into the mysteries of the kingdom, God. To step outside of that which has been troubling and into the invitation to dream again. Holy Spirit, we thank You that it is not by might nor by power, but by the empowerment of Your breath, God. And so we receive this today. We grab a hold of it. The violent grab the kingdom by force. We grab a hold of it as heirs, as sons and daughters who say that our portion is the glory of God to reflect and reveal it to the world and we say yes to this and amen in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. I, I wanna open with this passage, Psalms 126, that Haley was uh, actually sharing. Uh, verse one, when the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, they were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Why don't we just do a joyful shout on three? Ready? One, two, three. Whoa. That's good right there. It's good. I have to tell you, Twinview beat you though. It was pretty, they went nuts and got up on their chairs and it's okay. We're not going to keep doing that though. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are joyful. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as the streams in the south. I take that. We're building a big building. Restore the fortunes. <laughs> okay, anyway. Those who sow in tears shall harvest with joyful shouting. The one who goes here and there weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. That's just a, an awesome word. I wanna talk about it's, about it's time to dream. And um, I, I've had uh, several encounters that, some of them I've shared with you, and I've had uh, some new ones that, that kind of go along with where we're going. But before we get there, I wanna just talk for a few minutes about closing the door of the old season. As a matter of fact, I actually believe that the Lord has closed the door to a past season, and He's opened the door to another season, to a new season. In Philippians chapter three, Paul writes this, verse 13, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to know that this was written by the Apostle Paul. When he says forgetting what lies behind, he's not talking about a bad week with the children. He's not talking about, you might have had a flat tire on the way to work. This man was responsible for hundreds and maybe thousands of deaths of Christians. You have to imagine 
that he is shepherding congregations that are missing men, that are missing husbands, that are missing sons, that are missing mothers. He is shepherding congregations that, have, that he has specifically had such a negative impact on that literally there are people missing in the congregation because of his former life. And this man says, forgetting what lies behind. And I, I feel so strongly that the Lord wants, that the Lord has closed the door. And, I, and in, the, in the first service we were praying and I saw us knocking on the door God closed and it said, shame. And I, I wanna say that shame has no part in our lives. Like shame, listen, everybody has failed. Every, there's nobody in here that has 100% success rate. And I wanna tell you that, I think it's Revelation 13 that says that the accuser of the brethren accuses us day and night. And I feel like before we talk about dreaming, we have to talk about the fact that God has closed the door, that that door is illegal to open. Now, you might have to clean up a mess. You know, you might, you might have to bring closure. I'm not talking about being irresponsible. You might have to go say you're sorry. You might have to go repent of something. I get that, you know, but I'm not, but, but I do want us to move away from the failures of the past and begin to live future present instead of past present. Jesus made a strong statement in Luke chapter nine, verse 62. He said, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let me read it again. No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. How many know we're to plow with passion? We're to plow with passion. You can imagine Jesus is saying, listen, if you, if you take a hold of plow and you look back, you're an unfit person for the kingdom. I, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm just saying that the Lord has spoken to us and said, leave the door I close closed. Do not agree with shame and open the door. You know, if I allow shame, if I do something wrong, I had interaction with some, some brothers in, in the last month who I have failed and we had an interaction and I'm like, okay, I can't go back and fix that. All I can do is ask for forgiveness. And once that door's closed, if I keep looking back, I can't actually do what I'm called to do because I'm dragging along shame with me and the people who actually lose the most aren't me, they're the people that I'm supposed to have an impact on. Are you with me? Like I am not doing anybody a favor, like maybe I need to feel bad about this for about four or five more months so I can let my friend know I really am serious. I'm like, no, 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 that door is closed. I've been forgiven, we've been forgiven, we need to move on. Are you with me? Good word, Chris. The Lord has given all of us talents. Now, I know, you should know this, but the word talent in Matthew 25, the word talent is actually a sum of money. So, and I understand that Jesus is talking about hiding talents. He's actually talking about, in this parable, about hiding money. But how many of you know it's more than money? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's right. That wasn't very good. <laughs> how many of you know it's not just about money? How many know that Jesus is telling a parable about money, but it's a metaphor for so many things in our life? But it is about money too, because the parable is about money. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm waiting for you to get better. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm being a little funny. I'm pointing out that the Lord has given all of us, let's just use the English word talents and what we mean by talents. The Lord has given each of us a talent. He's given each of us something to invest in the kingdom. He's given us each something to invest in other people. Now, you may be the person who has one talent. You may be the person who has 10 talents. And if you're a one talent person, I know the competition is pretty strong. You're like, I don't feel very talented. John, like Haley, I, Haley was in my office this last week and I'm gonna embarrass her. I, I'm, Haley's like a 10 talent person. She can sing, she can dance, she can act. She plays like three instruments. She can preach. She can mother. She can lead. And I'm like, I, I just feel intimidated around her. <laughs> I'm like a one talent or two talent person and I do a lot with one or two talents. 
But I have a lot of them. Like we went bowling last week with my grandkids. I bowled a 42. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, well they, they, put, they put bumpers up and I bowled an 87. And I had six of my grandkids with me who all obviously very much out me. They were so embarrassed that they just let my grandkids were so embarrassed. They were just like, when a, when a ball went down and hit a pin, they're like, look, you did it. <laughs> like, like I'm eight. <laughs> like, whoa, Papa hit a pin. <laughs> but the point is, you, <laughs> you might be a one talent person, but the goal is to not bury that thing. And when you bury it, I don't know, I'll, I'll just tell you the end of that story. You know, a guy buries the talent, Jesus rebukes the guy for burying the talent, gives the talent, which is in this case money, gives the money to the guy who has the most. And I asked the Lord some years ago, Lord, does it mean the rich get richer? He said, no, the faithful get more fruitful. Wow. But here's the deal, that when, what, if you, what you've been given if you plant it, it will grow. But if you bury your abilities, not only will they die, but you will too. I'm pointing out that when this man, <laughs> when this man buried his talent, not only did he lose the use of the money, not only did the money not bless anybody, not only did the money not have an impact it was designed to have, but he actually was taken and off to weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> And I'm pointing out that when we don't use our talent to bless other people, it doesn't just cost them, it costs us too. I'm not talking about weeping and gnashing teeth, you're gonna to go to hell if you don't use your talent. I, I, I'm not saying that, Jesus said that. I'm saying... <laughs> it's right there in the Bible, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm not gonna recover from that. I'm just gonna go on. I'm just pointing out that when, that you have been, that you, all of us, everybody, there was nobody born with no talents. There's nobody that's born with no ability. There's nobody that's born with nothing they can do to actually help other people in life. There's nobody like that. No human like that. And when I use what I have, Maybe I'm the one talent guy and I look over at the 10 ta talent person and I'm like, uh, I I'm, I'm embarrassed that I have so little. Listen, I can get to the 10 if I will use the one. If I will give myself to what I'm called to give. Are you with me? So we have to lose this encumbrance. You know, Romans, uh, Hebrews 12 says, leaving our, this, the, the, or the sin and the encumbrances that so easily entangle us. Uh, I'm not talking about the sin today. I'm talking about the encumbrances. Things that we carry around that feel holy, but they keep us from being effective. Are you with me? That thing that everyone's forgiven me for, but I still drag it around. That thing that happened to me that wasn't my fault. I grew up in a pretty tough home. Had some things that I love to keep behind that door. Not the door of denial, the door of eternity. That is gone, Chris. Don't let your past affect your future. It's over. Don't go back and visit it. Don't open the door of pain. It's not going to help you. And I believe, in fact, I feel the prayer right this minute, I believe that some of us are knocking on a door that the Lord closed. And you're like, I need to get, I need to get there. So I know there's some counseling and all this stuff. And, and if the Lord you know, takes you a different direction, fine. But I feel strongly that some of us are trying to get closure for things that God closed years ago. And Lord, I pray right now, I release people from shame. The shame of if you really were serious, you'd still feel bad about it. And that is just junk. And I just release you to repentance, a new way of thinking. That the door that the Lord closed in your life, in my life, will remain closed the rest of my life into eternity. And the door that's open before me is the door that you want me to go through. 
And there's a whole new way of living in that zone. Amen. Thank you. Um, so I went to Oxford and I, I does anybody know Rachel Milano? She had an incredible, beautiful wedding, which many years ago I said, well, when you get married, I'll, I'll give you away. So she wrote me a few months ago, said, I'm getting married. Come give me away. I'm like, good. You having a wedding here? And she's like, no, it's in the UK. I'm like, oh, that's really giving you away. <laughs> so a beautiful wedding in this beautiful cathedral. That I, I have, have you guys ever been to cathedrals in the, you know, like in Europe, England? They're just incredibly beautiful. I think this one took like 300 years to build or something like that, some crazy thing. And, uh, and then we went to a castle for the reception. And uh, yeah, I was feeling very kingly. I was like, I slept at the castle. I was like, I was feeling so good about myself until my castle door wouldn't open. It literally wouldn't, and they couldn't get it open for hours, and finally they drilled it out. I'm like, Lord, this isn't a prophetic thing, like I'm locked out of kingship or something, is it? Because I was really feeling like bad about that. But it was, it was really awesome. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. But we went to Oxford, which Oxford is a city and a university. It's actually one. It's, uh, Oxford University is made up of 32 universities all together. And it was, uh, it was, it's 927 years old, the second, the oldest university in the world. And it's, uh, its motto is, the Lord is my light. And, uh, and Oxford had many, many powerful things that happened. One of the things is Charles Wesley's Methodist movement came out of Oxford in 1720. And so we're walking around Oxford and um, you can, if you haven't been there, you might just Google it, and see the, some of the buildings so you can kind of get the effect. It's these incredible, beautiful buildings that literally Oxford took hundreds of years to build. And I'm walking around and Simon is my, Simon is the guy that's uh, giving me the tour. And Simon is a scientist who's leading the space program and has a contract with NASA at Oxford. And Simon has been here five times. He loves this place because he gets revelation when he's here. And he started a supernatural school on Oxford campus. So I'm with Simon, who has, like, if you met him, you would think, oh, this guy's a scientist, until you sit with him. And he's brilliant, but he's happy. I guess that's okay to be both. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why he said that. <laughs> and Simon is taking us on a tour of Oxford, which is, you know, it's a couple days. And he set up some meetings with me, which I'll tell you about in just a few minutes. But as we're walking uh, around Oxford campus, uh, where Simon works, and you know, it's like you know, we're walking blocks and blocks, probably walk you know, three, four, five miles. And he's talking about the different things that happen at Oxford. And while he is, I just keep breaking out crying. <laughs> and like, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> we sit down at, at lunch at, in, at, on the Oxford campus and I'm, I just start crying. He's like, are you, are you okay? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> Have you ever had an experience where your head doesn't know what's going on, but your heart totally does? I'm like, I thought I was having menopause. <laughs> <laughs> or really bad jet lag. Like, like literally we just walk along and I just break out in tears. And he's like, are you okay? I'm like, I, don't, I actually don't know what's happening to me. Something's happening to me. And I, and I kept having these experiences where I, I, I honestly could not put my, I, I know I'm being a little funny, but I, a little uh, dramatic, but I literally could not figure out why I was crying. Like it wasn't like I saw something, it was moving. And I'm like, oh yeah, it wasn't like that. I just was maybe feeling the presence of God. And we were, we we're walking, this, I think it was the second day, we were walking down, uh, like these are all cobblestone roads with beautiful uh, stone buildings, beautiful stone buildings. And we're, and we're walking along the road and I, I have this vision. Now it wasn't open vision, it was, but it was very vivid in my mind. And I turned to Simon and I said, this is Bethel 200 years from now. He said, what? I said, this is Bethel 200 years from now. And he's like, wow. I said, I, 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 there's something on Bethel that's on Oxford. Like, I understand that Oxford is, 
you know, become very humanistic and needs a revival. I understand that, but there's something in the ground that is, something is resonating with my spirit in the ground. Like there's something about what's in Oxford ground that's in me that somehow my spirit is synergizing with what's in the ground. And I, it's like, it, I, I didn't even share this in first service. Like there's something familiar. It's like calling out to me. Like this, there's a, there's a family connection. <sighs> if you know what I mean, that's great because I don't. <laughs> I am articulating something that was happening that I am just putting words to. And I began to dream. And I'm like, wow, 200 years from now. And the first thing I started thinking about is I, 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 wrote, I, I wrote some notes. These are just, they're, they're not written for a book. I, I was just writing them as I was getting them. So they're, they're rough, okay? So you know, they probably need lots of edit. But I wrote this. I, I wanna read you the raw notes. Like as I was walking, I was like getting this. And I wrote, I realized today that when the religious world was asking what tribulation you believe in, pre-trib, post-trib, or mid-trib, I'll explain that for the younger people that probably had no idea what trib they're in. <laughs> Bill Johnson was asking the question, how much of heaven can we have on earth? Yeah. Now, for the, the old, for the younger generation, let me just, it, it would be normal for you not to understand what I just said. In the Jesus movement, and probably earlier, the question that every Christian was asking was, do you believe the rapture is gonna happen before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation? So you actually would identify with people like, they'd actually argue and split over it. And when you went to a prophetic conference, you didn't go to a conference where they taught you how to hear the voice of the Father. You went to a conference where there was charts and different speakers got up and pose their reason why the rapture would be at the beginning of the tribulation. And the beast would be here. And I actually got a tape series, and one of the tapes, tapes, the cassette tapes, it was a, you know what a cassette tape? Yeah. One of the cassette tapes was, this the, was the title, How to Keep Your Children from, from Taking the Mark of the Beast. Wow. So when I met, I met, Kathy and I met Bill and Benny four years after we were saved. So, you know, I'm like, okay, so I meet Bill and we're trying to get, to, you know, I'm getting to know each other. Well, I don't know if Bill's trying to get to know me, but I'm trying to get to know him. <laughs> and I remember asking Bill, like, are you, are we, like, are we, like, you're our leader. Are we like a pre-trib rap or a <laughs> mid-trib rap and a post-trib rap? And Bill's like, well, I don't know. I just want to know how much of heaven we can have on earth. Yes. And I'm like, that's not on that, it's not on the multiple choice <laughs> identity questions. I, I, mean, Bill, I mean, there was probably lots of other people, but Bill was the only leader I knew that wasn't trying to answer that question. Like it didn't trouble him that he didn't know the answer to that question. He was like, I just, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I never heard Bill do one message on the beast. <laughs> to this day, I'm still waiting for him to tell me who the beast is. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote this uh, while I was walking. Bill inspired insights into legacy, hope for future generations, honor, which is the highway to prosperity, and prophetic vision. And I began to realize at Oxford that there were people that started Oxford, Oxford that were asking different questions than other people were asking. There, metaphorically, people were like, when's the tribulation? What's gonna happen with the beast? And these people weren't answering those questions. They're answering questions that heaven was asking and being pulled in their early days, being pulled into another direction. Are you with me? And I, I wanna point out that when you build buildings that take 300 years to build, you have a very different way of thinking than a Jesus people movement person. Uh, let, me, let me say it differently because that sounded rude. What you, how you behave, how you view God, how you view yourself, and what you build out of that has everything to do with the core values of the way you see life. If you build a building that takes 300 years to build, and they have buildings that take longer than that, and I'm not talking about like they built the building then, then Joe added on to it. Then Henry got it in charge and he added two more bedrooms. I'm talking about the architect drew a building that took 300 years to build. 
and probably cost 10 times, no, 100 times more than that local congregation was ever going to raise in their generation. When people ask us, are you going to finish the building next week? I don't know. These people built buildings for 300 years that cost 100 times more than they could ever afford. And they actually believed that God was in this project that they, that, (laughs) are you with me? Not decades, centuries later, they would finish it. Listen, what kind of theology do you have to have to believe (laughs) that you should build something that you're not even freaking going to finish for 300 years? And you start this project that the people who are with you could never afford it, but the generations to come will finish it. Are you with me? I'm pointing out that you have to think differently than when is the beast coming? And are you pre-trib or post-trib? And we build ugly buildings. I'm not talking about we like y'all or like y'all. I'm talking about we have a different core value in Protestantism. We brag about the fact that we didn't spend extra. We got, you know, the church is in a building. Church is people of God. Well, that's true. That's absolutely true. But when you go into a cathedral, like Rachel's wedding, and it's got a steeple that's hundreds of feet high, and and you walk in there, and I understand like people would say, well, the spirit's gone. I I get that, but there's something about the people who built this, that they had a revelation of the majesty of God. They had a revelation of the majesty of God because they built something that reflected their values of the time. And yes, maybe, I, I, let's say, they didn't have a full revelation of God. I'm not sure we do either. Right, come on. But they built according to the revelation they had, and they were trying to express the fact without, you know, without amplification, without all the things that we have in these days, you know, PowerPoints and all that. They were trying to express, when you walk in there, that God is amazing. And they're trying to build a building that would say, we love a God who is majestic. Are you with me? (laughs) Okay. Maybe I'll lose you in a minute, but, and I'm pointing out something I'm pointing out. I'm pointing out that we need to Hold on to things old and build new. About um, a few days ago, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I was thinking about the impact that Oxford had on me. Sorry. The impact that Oxford had on me. I was just thinking about, you know, just really trying to find, like thinking for what was going on in here. Still, I still am. Like, what was that? And why did that happen? And how does it relate to us? And, I, and I, I, I said, well, I wonder, I, I started looking up the, some of our universities, Harvard. Harvard was built in uh, 1636, 387 years ago. It, its model was truth. And Harvard was named after its benefactor, the Puritan clergyman, John Harvard. It's the oldest institution of higher learning in the United States. Its influence, wealth, and ranking have made it one of the most prestigious universities in the world. In in its early years, Harvard primarily trained congregational clergy. Harvard was founded to train pastors. Its motto is truth. Get this. Yale was founded 321 years ago. Its motto is light and truth. Yale is the third oldest college in the United States. It started as a congregationalist college. At first, it was restricted to instructing ministers in theology and the sacred languages. Are you with me? Yale was started to train theologians, pastors in theology and the sacred languages. Its motto is light and truth. Princeton, Princeton's motto is, under God's power, she flourishes. 
It was founded in 1746, 276 years ago. Princeton University was founded as the College of New Jersey. It was first called the College of New Jersey and was shaped and shaped much of its formative years by the Law College, a seminary founded by Reverend William Tennant in Pennsylvania in 1726. The four founders of Princeton University devised a plan to establish a new college, listen to this, for they were disappointed with Harvard and Yale's opposition to the Great Awakening. Princeton was founded because people had pulled away from the, from the other universities, have pulled away from the Great Awakening, and Princeton was founded to establish ministers in the Great Awakening. That was its purpose. And remember, its model was, under God's power, she flourishes. And my point, do you know that we just established a college? <laughs> Our team up front. It, it, it's just a man's fist. A cloud the size of a man's fist. Basically, you have four, three cohorts right now. We're super excited about it, but... We just had the accreditors back this last week and they gave us the highest accreditation mark they've ever given a college. Super proud of our team. And I, I, I began to think about the fact that we know we've been preaching the old gym for two years, three years, getting back to the old gym. And I believe, you know, Jesus uh, I pointed out this. Uh, let me see if I can find the scripture. I mean, I can find scripture, but that scripture is what I'm looking for. Jesus said, stall. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus talked about the fact that we are to bring about things that are old, hold on to things that are old. Here it is, Matthew 13, 52. Jesus said, therefore, every scribe who's become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings out his treasure, things old and things new. I, I believe that the Lord is calling us to go back to the old gym and to make sure that we establish things old. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, all started in revival. All started by revivalists. And yet they have become some of the most humanistic institutions in the world. What would have happened to Princeton if they would have kept the Great Awakening awake? What kind of education would come out of Princeton, out of Oxford, out of Harvard? You get the idea. If they would have kept the center thing, the center thing. And I believe that God is asking us to hold on to things old. In fact, I believe that for three years, the Lord's been telling us, go back and get things old. Go back and get things old right. Go, did I make sense on that sentence? Go back and get the things that are old, get them right again. Get unleashed. Get out of performance mode. Get out of, get out of, I'm gonna, get out of <laughs> domestication mode. Get out of, I'm gonna look bad mode. The Lord's like, you had nothing, behave like that. I, I told you this, but a, few, a month or two ago, I was on a, we were doing a thing for the School of Prophets, I think, and uh, we were asking, the question was, what would your old, what would your, what would your old man tell your, your young man? What would your, what would your present man tell your young man? And the Lord said to me, you're not answering that question. I want you to answer the question, what would your young man tell your old man? And I'm sitting there and I start crying. I'm like, I don't wanna tell my young man something. My young man needs to tell my old man, take a risk. There you got, what do you got to lose? Cross the chicken line. <laughs> I could say some more things, but we're streaming. That's what my young man would say. <laughs> I got to tell you this last thing that happened. We were in a prayer meeting um, a couple weeks ago, a Thursday morning prayer meeting. By the way, you're welcome to come. We don't make a big deal out of it because we just pray for government people. And we pray for governments and people. A Thursday morning, it's in like an hour and a half. So we're in that meeting praying. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I was, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of people were praying about, look, we always pray about, about government, about our city, uh, just praying for, you know, what, what God's doing. And um, all of a sudden, I had a vision. It wasn't an open vision, but it was very vivid. Did I tell you this yet? 
I preached so many times, same message. And it was a vision. You know how uh, Reno has like this arch over it? I think it's Reno. And it says, Reno, the smallest, biggest city in the world or something like that. Well, I saw an arch like that, but it was over Reading. And it said Reading. And then under it said, it's the glory of God to hide a matter. And it's the glory of Kings to search it out. And I, I, began to, I began to see that Reading is going to be a center of invention, innovation, and discovery. I saw scientists and astronomers and medical breakthroughs and inventions and innovations and the stars in the heavens. This is very interesting. The stars in the heavens were yielding creation secrets. It's going to be the epic center of a coming renaissance and beauty and art will be the central theme of Reading. There'll be, there'll be, I saw an a, a observatory, which I know we have one now, I didn't remember it then. I saw an observatory for astronomy in the midst of Reading, and I saw people coming to, that were studying astro specifically astronomy, and God was opening up like he did in the days of Galileo. He was opening up the heavens, and we were finding incredible breakthroughs that were yielding. I, I wrote this, the heavens were yielding their secrets, and God says it's going to happen again. And I saw, I, I saw this connection between Oxford and all, all this revelation that was happening with the founders of Oxford and all these, you know, and crazy, uh, Rolls Royce was founded out of Oxford. I could just go on and on about all these companies that you would know about that were founded often by revivalists who love God and who were going after creation stuff. And I believe that we are in the midst. We move from, reform, uh, we move from revival, which is, us getting saved, us getting revived, to reformation where Isaiah 61, four says, now when you're revived, go back and heal your broken cities. But that's not the end of the all. We're, going, we're moving from reformation to renaissance, which is about beauty, it's about glory, it's about majesty. I can't even imagine what's gonna be built, what's gonna be said, what's gonna be, what's gonna be acted out as we begin to go after majesty. Would you stand? You might be in here and you're, you're maybe you, you don't know the Lord or you, you, maybe even on our online campus, you're with us today. I just want to say, first of all, thank you. What an honor it is to have you here and, and the Lord drew you. And if you would like to actually be a follower of the Lord, a disciple of Christ and know him, I'd love for you just to raise your hand put your, or put your hand in the chat because I would love for you to, I would love to pray for you if that's you. Would you just raise your hand in here? We had somebody in first service really... Cool, okay, so Lord, we just bless this day. We thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that we would come out of the captive season and we'd begin to dream again. Yeah. Bless, I bless this day as a day of new doors opening into a new day, a new season. And I bless you that shame is past. We're moving in majesty, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, thank you so very much. Do you have a knowing that you carry answers to impossible questions and improbable challenges inside of you? The truth is we have access to the fount of all wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the capacity for brilliance that is beyond human reason and transcends logic. The Solutionaries Intensive is a 12-week course that will teach you a four-step process for gathering, analyzing, and applying intel received from the Holy Spirit to form practical solutions for leaders' real challenges. Through coursework, you will grow in confidence in your ability to hear the voice of God, work with small teams to pursue wisdom of God, and unlock heaven's solutions to serve society all around you. Enrollment for the next cohort is now open and closes September 12th of 2023. You can learn more and register at www.thesqinstitute.com.